Hi, this is Tim Hinton, the Beast of the Marching Arts and the host of the Marching Roundtable podcast. The entire marching arts community was very sad this week to hear the news about the cadets. We each have very personal and meaningful memories of this drum corps and what it's meant to us over the years. But as sometimes happens when these big events are happening, there's a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation being shared online. The Marching Roundtable has always tried to be a place to have conversations and to share information to make sure people are getting the right information about what's going on in our activity. So in this spirit, we're re-releasing a podcast from 2022 called What Drum Corps Should Cost. This podcast conversation cuts through some of the noise and misinformation and helps give us a clearer context from which to talk about the activity, what it does for young people, and how it really works. We get some behind the scenes information here I think that you will really appreciate and will help you have better conversations about what's going on in the marching arts activity right now. You can see a video version of this podcast from 2022 on the Marching Roundtable YouTube channel. I hope you listen again. I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. I think at times we all in our own communities and not just drum corps, um, I wonder if there's a flavor of undervaluing the arts. Um, And I I go back to some of the challenges too, as a core director, the easiest thing for us to resolve is if there's a student whose only barrier to marching in a drum corps is financial, every one of us on this call can help resolve that. If the student's willing to put into work um, and, and do the work, Cost is going to be a factor in no matter what you do, what kind of car you drive, where you choose to go to school. All of those things come with, you know, varying costs. But let's have the conversation. Let's let's not start out by just assuming, well, I can't afford this. Hey everybody, welcome to the Marching Roundtable Podcast. This is Tim Hinton, the beast of the marching arts. This is going to be such a valuable and interesting conversation. Hey everybody, what should drum corps cost? We are gonna talk about that today and about solutions and outcomes and things that are being done and things that are being helped with. It's gonna be really great. Here on the line today, Bob Jacobs. Bob, how are you? I am great, Tim, thanks very much. And of course, of course Bob is uh, from Jersey Surf and DCI Marketing. And uh, Vicki McFarland, Vicki, how are you? Doing great. I'm glad that you're here. Of course, you're here from the Colts and the DCI board. And Chris Comnick's here from the Scouts and from DCI membership chair. Chris, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. So, Bob, you put together a really great group here. I think you're bringing lots of perspectives, people that are in the thick of the drum corps activity. Um, So where do you want to start the conversation about what drum corps should cost? Well, I, I think one of the reasons we wanted to get together with you today and have this conversation because there's a lot of misconceptions perhaps or just whisper down the lane kind of conversations that have taken place over the course of time about why does drum corps cost what it costs in the first place and i think sometimes folks um you know they see something on the field and they just assume wow that must cost a lot and then and it's costing someone a lot but it doesn't always cost the drum corps a lot and in it, what they see on the field isn't necessarily evenly divided amongst all of the core members. Uh, I think we have some pretty, you know, c- pretty compelling research that we do every year with our individual groups and with all of the groups uh, uh, across the board that the value that is delivered per member far exceeds the, the amount that is charged per member. And different cores handle that in different ways um, with you know, boards of directors getting involved with the fundraising for the the difference between those things or perhaps an endowment or perhaps there are other revenue streams. Uh, I can speak from the standpoint of the Jersey Surf. We're a very lean organization. We have no paid administrative staff. We have an office manager. That's that's it. Uh, and so everybody on our admin team is volunteer. And therefore, a huge percentage of our operating budget is funded by the member fees. Um, this year, we we recently we tried an experiment. We reduced our member fees by a thousand dollars 
to purposely make our membership fees $3,300 instead of $4,300, which is more kind of like the going rate, even though we don't know specifically. Um, and it didn't really have a net effect on suddenly people were storming down the doors at 3,300 versus 4,300. But but in our group, we we don't we we do have all the revenue streams, but not to the not to the level where it is supporting a tremendous amount of overhead or a tremendous tremendous amount of operations. I'm sure that Vicky and and Chris can give you their take on you know as they put together their budgets every year, the, the various sources that help to pay for what it is that they're doing. Yeah, I could talk to that point, uh, you know, in regards to the Madison Scouts, uh, essentially our budget is built around what are the direct costs associated with the student and their students' participation. Uh, and in our organization, um, you know, what we tend to target is about 50% of underwriting the actual cost that a student incurs. So. For example, if we charge $1 in tuition, we're actually delivering about $2 of direct services to that student. Uh, and this is what we explain to our students. So, you know, and our tuition is about 49, our tuition is $4,900 this year. Um, you know, it's about $9,800 that we are providing in actual direct costs associated with that student. And those are the things that are, are, are very direct. So it is the instructional cost, it is, uh, the design team cost, it is the, it, and primarily it's the transportation, uh, it's the food and it's the facilities. That's actually the primary cost that's associated on that side of it. Um, so every dollar that a, a student spends on it, they're actually getting $2 back in value. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of the mix that we try to look for. And, and certainly when talking with a lot of my colleagues, they're probably about in the same category. Um, there are certainly outliers in this activity, and every organization kind of approaches it somewhat differently. Uh, but that 50-50 is about uh, what I have seen pretty consistently. Bolts is very similar on that two to one. We base when we when the board sets the membership dues or fees each year, it's based on uh, like a, any student should not contribute any more than 50% of the cost of membership. So that would be the highest we, we would go is ever 50% of the cost. And then uh, with other drum corps might be, they might only do a third of the cost at some different places. Uh, for Cole Cadets, that percentage is also very similar. And we have the world class and the open class core. In thinking about Bob's challenge to this conversation, I actually took um, our budget and I looked at what do Colts members pay? And in both cores, it worked out the same way at the Colts and Cole Cadets, that students cover the cost of busing, the educational and design teams, food, housing, uniforms. Now Colts members pay a little premium for support, like the insurances, some um, insurance athletic trainer, tour director, the open class core may not have the same need at Cole Cadets for that, and we have a, some shared areas. Here's what tuition does not cover if we think about that 50%. So at the Colts and Coconuts, tuition does not cover anything a student pays, does not cover equipment, does not pay for electronics, it does not cover props, scenery, any full-time staff for benefits, any of our facilities, any volunteer expenses, uh, the semi-tractors, trailers, computers, utilities, or the media team, or any staff meetings. That is what the organizations are finding the fundraising to cover. So if I'm understanding you guys right, the, Chris and Vicki, you both explained that there, this, the, there's about half of the cost of actually getting the show on the road, giving the student the experience, having the whole summer happen. About half of that comes from the member dues, but the other half you're raising in some other way. The core Correct. itself is raising in some other way. Correct, and that come from, can come from a variety of sources. Uh, it can come from direct fundraising, so actually going and finding donors, uh, grants and, and foundations and stuff that you pursue. Uh, some of the cores have, you know, biz pseudo businesses that they run, and I'll, I'll take for the Madison Scouts, for example, because uh, I hear this a lot, like, well, you guys are changing horns every year. It's like, well, we actually change and sell our horns every year. It's part of a relationship that we have with Yamaha. Uh, and there's actually uh, money that's made and helps underwrite that portion of the core uh, based off of that uh, relationship. 
Um, and you know, there's certain they're selling merchandise, right? The branded Madison Scott's merchandise. That's something that comes in and, and helps uh, helps fund it. Uh, so yeah, so for you know every dollar that a student spends on tuition, we're raising a dollar uh, also that goes towards you know these direct expenses as well uh, through a variety of means. Yeah, so to that point, everybody, every time you buy a drum corps shirt because you love the core and you want to remember this experience and everything, you're helping that core get down the road. And you know, I don't think everybody knows that, that they're actually specifically funding that core's existence and their ability to be there that night that you saw the performance. Um, or that you even watched it in the movie theater and still went home and bought a t-shirt, which you ought to do, everybody. Um, what's interesting, Chris, is that you're just, you just told me, if I was a parent, you said to me, all right, I can give your student $10,000 experience, but it's only going to cost you five. I'm probably going to be like, wow, sign me up. Like, I, I you're going to give me half off what my student's actually getting to experience. Like, that's a pretty good deal. But, Bob, nobody ever thinks of it that way. That's correct. You know, in, in because we have the, le the leaner operation and we're a little smaller in our physical plant, our portion isn't 50-50. Our membership fees pay about 75% of our total operation, and we're responsible to raise the other 25. Um, so it's not, you know, but, but it, economies of scale being what they are, it all works. The, sure. and, and to Chris's point, um, you know, when, like what we see a lot on social media or what we, when we get letters sent to us or, or or even new parents asking the question, and they talk about, uh, geez, you know, this is a really expensive hobby. And and it's really easy to say, well, you know, I have a neighbor whose kid plays hockey, and that's an expensive hobby. So when we when we examine that, we realize that the cores, on average, are generally delivering an experience at fifty to seventy dollars a day. When you break it down to just the cost per day to go on tour, based on you know just the, the gross numbers. Now, there are very few, including the major arts camps and the major multi-session sports camps, there are very few summer enrichment experiences that occupy the 60 some odd days that DCI's spring training plus tour does. So when you when you spread out the cost across, you know, if like in my group this year will be 68 days from the day we move in till the day we come home. And the uh, the cost per day for us is like $58. So we went to look to see, okay, so we're really delivering $120 a day camp experience, which puts it more on the par of something like a, a, a two-week resident soccer camp where you're getting a jersey at the end of the deal and all that. But it's, you know, very minimal instruction. There's coaching, of course. There's an athletic trainer or nurse or whatever on duty. But it doesn't include a 10,000 mile bus ride. It doesn't include 230 meals that you're getting served, you know, in, in this mobile food service uh, uh, environment. And then all the other things that come with being a part of the DCI tour, tangible and intangible. Um, when you look at the national averages for summer camps of all sorts, everything from the top of the line golf camp in Connecticut to interlock-in to any of the major stuff, all the way down to like Boy Scout camp. Uh, very, very few things come in at a lower day cost than Drum Corps does. Um, you know, especially with, with how it has evolved now with so much of a focus on the member experience. On, you know, we're not push starting our buses down a hill and thinking that it's quaint, you know, or we're not dropping everybody off at McDonald's and Taco Bell and saying, see you in an hour. You know, it's 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 something that with athletic trainers and and the the health and safety with all the background checks and you know everything that we're we're consciously and proactively doing. You know, it okay. So you have to wind up asking a student. I get it. You can't afford it, and it doesn't matter how much of a value it it is if you can't afford it. So in order for us to lower the price, which parts of this experience would you like us to abandon? Would you like to not tour as long? Well, no, I want to. I want to travel the country. Would you like to not play on newer instruments? No, I, I love the new instruments. They're great. Well, how about the uniforms? Should we go back to the old days of wool uniforms that last forever? No, no, let's not do that. Let's not do that. So, you know, there are very few things that people really want to give up because they they more than anything else. And I think this is out of all the things that I read from folks that that get like upset over the cost of drum corps. 
what they don't understand is that so much of what we do is responsive to what the 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 young people that we serve what they what kind of an experience they want you know we we listen to them you know this year dci is has has taken a big step in scaling back i think i read a uh, uh something earlier this week that the average core this year will do four shows less than what they did in 2019 and that's that's not because there's a lack of demand for the shows people there's actually pent up demand for shows it's just that everybody's decided to kind of exhale a little bit and say you know what last year was not a competitive focus much more of a performance focus we didn't operate at we still had a sense of purpose those of us that participated in the tour but we didn't have this breakneck like gotta gotta find that extra tenth which is you know woven into our into our culture into the dna of the activity so so the conversation at our fall directors meeting was you know what that it didn't kill us to give everybody a little more rest to take a little wear wear and tear off of the organization and let's reinvent how this looks it will will it diminish the experience well no it will it will enhance the experience because theoretically we'll have a well better rested group you know yeah it's four days over the course of the season but you know tim all the things that go into those four com competitive days it isn't just show up and compete it's everything leading up to and coming out of that yeah no absolutely and i i i'm just sitting here thinking of a conversation i had one time with somebody at the top drum course saying well i could really tell the kids got a lot of sleep last night because they were really going out the next day and i'm like you know so that that to your point it's like maybe having a little extra rest here and there is not a bad idea it's a grueling summer schedule and um, it, it's really interesting what you say. Like, I think you're right. I don't think anybody wants drum corps to be less than it is. But, and, and then you say, on the other hand, okay, and we're giving them double what they're actually paying for through this experience. And it's like 60 days long. Like, all of that's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But then I see people go like, yeah, but kids still got to come up with $5,000. Well, okay, so you know, that, that takes the conversation in a different direction. I don't know if we're ready to go there yet or not. But um, we do want as many people to be able to participate in this as possible, but unless, I, I mean, I sitting here listening to this conversation, I don't know what to do. Like Chris or Vicky, is there anything that we can do to make the, like, make the experience as great as it is, but not cut things? Like that seems like a, a tricky question that's not, has ever a good answer. Sure, it's a super tricky question because you got to balance what is, you know, the level of excellence that is expected out of drum corps Drum Corps International um, versus what you can practically build. Uh, and you have to make some choices. Uh, you know, sometimes they're difficult choices because they could have competitive implications. Uh, you know, from our perspective, one of the things that we've not wanted to, we wanted to make sure that everything from a, you know, safety standards, transportation, you know, food is, is where it needs to be from a quality and a, uh, delivery standpoint uh, in that regard, but you do have to make some other choices. You know, how far and long are you going to tour? Um, you know, we have, we're one of the groups that have pulled back on the number of shows that we're participating in uh, on purpose. Uh, you know, last year we really experienced a, a, a tremendous member experience. And, you know, when we got the feedback from the members from the shortened tour, the, the different type of scheduling, we wanted to try to replicate that as much as possible. So, you know, our first competition this year is on July 2nd. Uh, you know, instead of uh, slogging out what has typically been seven, eight weeks of drum corps, it's pretty much down to six weeks. Um, and, you know, we're making some decisions on our daily schedules that are incorporating a lot more sleep, less rehearsal. Um, and that has a competitive implication. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But, you know, we're really focusing on that member, that member experience and that member culture in a different way. Um, and we hope, you know, there probably will be some gains from that as well in terms of being well rested and from a performance perspective. Um, now, that's not making it cheaper. <laughs> Absolutely. But what we did discover kind of through the COVID process was, you know, we've developed a lot of really strong online processes for teaching. Uh, so this year we made a decision that we would have, you know, an audition process in uh, the November, December time frame, and then not have any camps during the winter time. Uh, and we ended up deciding to have a, because we lost one of the fall camps uh, due to COVID, 
uh, we ended up having a brass camp in March, but pretty much, you know, we have not really seen the core in person uh, pretty much from November until late March and actually the full core percussion and, and color guard until uh, late April. Um, so that's a long time of distance, but we we are seeing them virtually every almost every single day. Uh, and they're taking lessons online with our instructors and it's more efficient, it's more cost effective uh, for the students. They've had obviously less travel uh, as a result of that. Uh, and that's been able to help reduce and remove some of those costs out of the equation. Uh, one of the things we also did is really change our cost for auditioning for the core. So, um, you know, typically we've been up around 125, 150 to audition. We took that all the way down to $25 this year, um, knowing that, you know, we wanted to be able to see more kids and have them come in. And the results have been pretty good. We've seen uh, a great number of kids come through the process and at least test it out and see if this is something that they wanted to do. So, you know, we are constantly looking for ways that we can remove some of these cost components from the equation. And I know my, my colleagues are doing the same. Yeah, I, I think what's interesting about what Chris describes and, and for us at Colts, it was we did a combination of live events. I call it the hybrid year. 2022 is the year that is hybrid uh, because some students will not participate in virtual experiences. And and for us with Colt Cadets, with beginners, it's very hard to like do all the details that we want to do in a virtual setting. So we've done a combination of live and online activities so each student could essentially pick their own path in a lot of ways to before we bring the the core together but trying to meet all the varying needs of different people and to and i think to comic's point there was great in in terms of we're not gonna like we will not sacrifice the member experience for anything competitive and and i think that's can be what's interesting for uh a lot of people don't always realize. I mean, sometimes like within the directors or within the core, it might feel different than sometimes what you might read on social media. And in the group of directors, the student leadership that we have in our organizations, making sure the experience is of the quality and, and is of the comfort and safety that people want. Yes, drum corps is still hard. And most of the, the life experience that so many people get out of this activity, and why so many people give back, it is is because it is one of the most demanding experiences most people go through. If I go back though to the simple cost, the nice part of doing drum corps for 60 to 80 days is if you don't have to pay housing and you don't have to buy food, you know, if you don't need to provide your own transportation. And, and that's where to me, I believe the it, it feels at a reasonable point when I look at what are we offering and I, I don't want to give any of it up. You get used to not pushing starting buses, Bob. Like, I don't want to go back to those days. <laughs> and it's a quality of life thing that is important that does equate to sleep and, and enjoyment. And I mean, when the buses are, all have internet provided too, it's, it's nice. Wow. <clears throat> and it's yeah, hard so to go when, back. Later. Yeah, as someone that was there in the push the bus phase, days of this all, I don't want to stick back there either. I love that you made that point, Vicki, that people don't remember, don't forget well, people don't think sometimes they don't remember. Okay, damn it. I got to edit this. Hang on a minute. 20. That was really tongue tie. Um, what people don't realize sometimes is that there's actually a savings perhaps for the student in the summer. They're off the grid for 60 days. And that sometimes that means they can turn off things, turn off that they're not paying maybe a, an apartment rent or they're not paying for car insurance or like there's, there's ways you can sort of turn your life off for a couple months while you're being taken care of on the tour. That's a savings people sometimes don't think about. Um, and I love that you guys talked about um, that the cores when possible now are taking the lessons from the shutdown and are using them this great online learning. They're being so efficient. Students are, are getting great experiences year round now in ways that we really weren't doing like that, certainly at this level beforehand. And I love, Chris, that you guys, um, when you could, you canceled those camps because traveling to a winter camp during the winter season, that's a that's an added cost that can be really, really expensive for people. If you're flying across the country or whatever. So I love that whether it's a hybrid version or you can turn them all off or whatever everybody's doing, you guys are constantly thinking about the member experience. You said that many, many times. 
Um, and, and I appreciate that. I think I think we're you we're being innovative in ways that people don't realize. And Vicky, to your point, there's no doubt that what's actually happening in the drum course with the member experience is not what's happening in social media. Like, come on, we all know the social media is not real and that what people are saying and all this stuff. But that's why we're having this conversation. Right. Um, we're getting back to sort of the what's re what's really happening. I wonder sometimes, too, I just think of it. I think at times we all in our own communities and not just drum corps. Um, I wonder if there's a flavor of undervaluing valuing the arts. Um, and I, I go back to some of the challenges too, as a core director, the easiest thing for us to resolve is if there's a student whose only barrier to marching in a drum corps is financial, every one of us on this call can help resolve that. If the student's willing to put into work, um, and, and do the work. And, and a lot of times for us, it's recognizing those students that, and, and for world class especially, uh, that they're, you know, there's a skill set point. That's where I like the Cole Cadets analogy. Cole Cadets take any, uh, anyone with no experience who wants to be great and um, can, and is a good team player. It's kind of our joke about that. That's all they, that you need to do. You don't need any experience. It's a lower access point. It's only eighteen hundred and fifty dollars to march Cole Cadets for the entire summer. That's all. That's all in. Now, if it was just about money, Cole Cadets would have one hundred and fifty, one hundred and sixty-five students, no problem. And that's where I do think that this conversation carries a lot of different angles and vantage points. I think that's a very valuable point, Vicky. That there's a misconception that. The only reason that kids don't do drum corps is because of the expense of doing drum corps. And really, there's there's a lot of evidence that there's more to it than that. That's that's an easy excuse. And again, it, we're not pretending like it doesn't have a cost associated with it. But the uh, if you know if if the I don't I don't even know off the top of my head what the average open class core costs. But let's just make the assumption that it's less than the average world-class experience. And if it was purely financial, every open class core would be full. Um, and you know what I'm learning this year with our experiment, part of it, part of it has to do too, I, I know that the Jersey Surf has the good fortune of being geographically located in, in between several major markets. So our membership comes from Northern, Northern Virginia and the Washington DC suburbs, uh, you know, area around that Maryland, and then uh, southern New Jersey and the Philadelphia suburbs and outside of New York City and, and those northern New Jersey suburbs. So we're drawing from rather strong zip codes in terms of the uh, economic situation and all that. And, and I know like every year I start out at the first couple of camps with you know, some questionnaires with the core members and very, very few of the core members have jobs these days. Whereas before they would all get up and, you know, work whatever they had to work, get as many hours as they had to get to, to save the money for drum corps. And, and uh, you know, I used to joke around and say, you know, you, you, could, you, you used to be able to tell a kid, hey, get up early and deliver the newspaper. But now they're like, excuse me, what's a newspaper? You know, and, and there's, there's like n those kinds of jobs don't exist quite certainly. But there still are a lot of other things that could, could happen. And we see it, there are some very industrious creative problem solving things that I have seen core members do over the years. But for the most part, um, what, what I guess Chris and Vicki and I share as well as the other directors uh, is, is the frustration with people that perhaps don't even try to get involved because they just feel that it's insurmountable from day one. And you know, I might, there's no way I can come up with 4,000 or 3,000 or 2,000. So then, okay, so what should drum corps cost? What, what kind of experience do you want? You know, things do cost money. And, you know, then, then it plays into some of these misconceptions. Like, well, ever since DCI became national, it costs too much. It, if DCI would go back to a regional model, it would be cheaper to do drum corps. And that is, that is only true if, as Vicky was just saying, if everyone goes home every night and feeds themselves. And there's, you know, like if if I do a regional tour, which we will do for the first part of the season, the buses cost me the same as if I'm going to to California. I mean, it's the same cost per day for the bus. And if I get too far out of my region, 
before I set down roots, I mean, I, I can't send the buses home for the night. We're, you know, we're kind of wherever we are. The buses cost the same, whether they are moving or whether they're sitting still. So the old model of regional drum corps worked when we were back in the days of the two core thing, or maybe you did sectionals on Thursday night, and then Saturday you went on a trip and you came home Sunday night, and then you were home again until Thursday night, or how, however it used to be back in the day. Um, this year, what we're trying is, we, we had to take last year off because of COVID. We, we did not participate in the celebration tour. We just did some local educational events. And when we put together this year's schedule, we purposely scheduled it in two halves. So we do have first tour and second tour this year. We're taking a break in the middle. There were, there were two reasons we did it. Number one, we knew we would have a lot of new members. So rather than throwing them in all at once and just trying to figure it out, we could tell them from day one, look, you know, yeah, it's hot right now and, and the mosquitoes are in your face, but you're going to be home in your own pool in four days. So calm down. You know, let's let's get through this. The other thing is we knew that because we have gotten to be pretty regional in our reach, we're no longer a southern New Jersey, Philly area core, which is where we were for the first half of our existence or more. Um, we don't have the volunteer base that we used to have. So just as hard as it is to recruit a whole new drum corps full of performers, you also have to break in a whole new crew of cooks and drivers and you know prop builders and whatever else you're doing, seamstresses. So we figured by doing it with two halves and because of where we're geographically located, it would give us a couple of different opportunities for people to maybe give us a week of their vacation or five days of their vacation without it turning into this you know, hey, I'm joining the French Foreign Legion and I'll see you in three months. You know, I'm going off to war, that kind of thing. So um, so, so we tried to build in that, that you know, you're going to have a mental health break. It's not an overwhelmingly intimidating experience. We're going to be very judicious as to how we lay out the number of days on the road. And, you know, and we're hopeful that in the final analysis that yes, we're gonna lose a couple performance opportunities from a competitive standpoint, perhaps, but we know that um, from before we started to do the full-time tour, when we did approach things in two chunks, we know that by the time you get to the end of that break, uh, people are ready to chew themselves off the chain because they just can't wait to get back on the road. And they do come back, you know, smelling fresh as a daisy with half the amount of clothes that they had on the first tour because they realize all the things that they really didn't need to bring with them in the first place. And we weren't lying when we said you need twice as many socks as you thought you do. And, you know, probably half as many shirts or, you know, whatever the deal might be. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see as we bring it back online this summer, um, you know, if this winds up providing us with even more insights. We're, we're taking off the week that the tour goes to Texas. And then as the, as the tour comes back from Texas, we're regathering and then heading down to meet the tour in the South where what would have normally been the Atlanta regional, which this year is split between Atlanta and Winston Salem. Yeah, I love that you're describing though, that there's like, everybody's being innovative and trying things and seeing what works best for my group. Um, you know, I don't think people realize that, that Drum Corps International is like, it's, it's the overhead of the whole group. It's like the, the umbrella, but like, it's really each individual core is their own individual core. They all do their own thing. They figure this out on their own way. And I love that you're describing about it. You guys sort of figured out, okay, well this, let's try this, you know, let's see if this works best for our members and our situation for our core in this year. Like, I love that, that you're thinking that way. Um, what, I'm, what, I, what I've been thinking a lot as we were getting ready for this conversation, the last few days I've been thinking that when I marched drum corps, okay, everybody, I'm really old. I marched my first season in 1980, okay, when I showed up at the Phantom Regiment. But we were doing what you described, Bob. There were two tours, and then there was all this time at home where people were actually working, and we had some evening rehearsals, and, like, you got back on the bus for the weekend to go to a regional con contest, and then you were back home again. So the cost for the core, you know, they weren't feeding us. For, the, for week after week at the time. And I think what happens is that old dogs like me sometimes sit around and think, well, you know, it really was it was really cheap back in the day when I marched, like, why is it now $5,000? Well, let's all remember everybody that now, like these kids are showing up for 60 days and they're touring the country and it's endless tour. And it's a great, great experience for those members, but it's not like it was back in the day when it was really cheap. So Vicki, you're, you're like smiling, but I mean, you know what I mean? like. Drum Corps is built on the way it used to be. You know, it's it's been around for now 50 years and we love it. 
but it's really, it's still for, for each of us drum course what it was when we marched. So for people that are my age that marched back in the late 70s, 80s, whatever, that's what we think drum corps is, but it's not that anymore. I was yeah, laughing. A... Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go. Oh, you go. <laughs> You're right. That It is an apples to oranges comparison. Uh, also coming from about the same time period as you, Tim, uh, it was a very different experience. Uh, the amount of uh, you know food that we were fed, uh, we mostly were restaurant meals. Uh, there was a lot of coming home in between. There was a lot of downtime. The other big thing is back then, most of the cores owned their own buses, um, yeah. and yeah. that is just a very difficult thing to do nowadays. Um, just from a compliance, DOT, uh, maintenance, all those sorts of things make it very, very difficult. Uh, to remove that cost out of the equation. Uh, there are still some groups that have one or two buses or maybe they're entertainer coaches or for, for running staff and stuff. Um, but across your entire fleet, it is difficult. And that's, you know, that's still the biggest expense. Um, you know, when I look at my equation of what our costs are this summer, the largest single check that we write is to our bus company right now. Um, and uh, that's the biggest uh, biggest cost that we have in the equation. Right, and, and gas prices, everybody. I mean, come on, like there's there's a lot of pieces of this puzzle that people just. Yeah, I mean, you know, to talk to that, if you want to talk about, you know, what scares me, and my board always asks me, what scares you as you come up to this year? It is there is so much variance right now um, in managing. You know, what we have record inflation was announced this year, or the just yesterday, uh, in terms of what we're facing. Um, I think almost every one of us has gotten a call from our charter company and our charter company has little clauses in there that said, once gas hits a certain thing, we're charging you more. And, you know, we got a very significant bump uh, in our charter costs this year because of, uh, you know, uh, because of what's going on with the fuel prices. Um, you know, supply chain issues, drivers where, you know, used to be able to get volunteer drivers. Drivers are being, CDL drivers are being paid so much elsewhere right now. You know, like to even get them to come over and even think about driving for drum corps, you've got to, you know, it's costing a lot of money. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of variables that are hitting us, a perfect storm of costs right now that are uh, kind of scary, quite honestly. Um, you know, and it's, uh, uh, that's a tough thing to, to kind of work and manage through at this point. Well, it's, it's quite amazing. Like, I always think it's quite phenomenal that a drum corps ever gets on the road and shows up at any one show because it's so complicated and there are so many pieces of the puzzle. And like people just see what they see when the corps comes out and performs and leaves and they don't think about all the pieces. That's why I like having these conversations. OK, so one other thing I want to ask you is, is OK, so even if if five thousand dollars is actually a great price for what we're getting for the great member experience over all this time and everything. Um, and listen, everybody, I, you know, I, I, with with Paul Paul Richardson here at Marching Arts Education, we created the Paying for Drum Corps presentation. You watch for an hour, and it gives you an hour of ideas on how to pay for drum corps. So I think coming up with the money, I agree with you guys. I don't think that's necessarily the big deal. But how do we get past the other pieces of it? Because there are um, there are groups in our world that aren't participating, whether whether they think it's too much money or whether they just don't think they're welcome. So how do we make get the word out to everybody that we want everybody to be included? I probably would pick on where you said it's a great price to do drum corps. I think all of us on this call think it's a fair price. I think in a lot of ways. I would use the word fair more than I'd use okay. the word great. I, I also agree. think it's important to understand that every every one of our board of directors um, those members discuss keeping tuition and those things as low as possible, as much as possible. Um, go back to what, what was your question? Tim, my my question was, okay, so if we have found it a fair price and we're giving people double the value of what they're actually paying, we still have whole populations who aren't participating. Um, and this may not be the conversation, to, this may not be the, the time to have that conversation, but I feel like if people are, if we can get people to say like, okay, well, maybe it is a fair price and maybe they are getting a lot for what they're paying, but there are still people that aren't signing on. Um, you know, now any ideas on how to reach them? Not specific ideas, but some brainstorming thoughts. And this is where at Colts, one of the things 
in studying our diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. It made us look at some things in different ways. And, and so one of the ideas we had was really breaking things down into short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals. Another thing that we had realized is, and there's some shared efforts in having two drum corps, you know, most organizations don't have that. But that's where we realized the key point for us is accessibility through the open class core, making sure that, that all students have access. But when we asked the Colt student leadership team, one of our board members was um, surveying them um, in a meeting, you know, she asked, it was fascinating, she asked them how many of you had private lessons or, you know, individual lessons of some sort even for Color Guard. Every single student leader raised their hands. So that was where for us, we all of a sudden had this acknowledgement access or even interest in private lessons before they get to our organizations is an, an incredible layer of importance. Uh, that's where for, and, and I guess where I look at it more, if we want more local engagement for Colts, working with our city's multicultural center, working with different projects to expand outreach, especially in the schools where there's 80% uh, free reduced lunch programs, providing access to uh, instruments to those students and education, it's still a challenge, but that would help us get there long-term. These, uh, most of these answers, I think, Tim, there's not going to be an overnight answer. There's not gonna be a next year answer, but I believe there are ways we can impact a difference and, and that organizations, not just the Colts, um, are invested in those opportunities and making sure those resources are shared. The last few years have given us a call uh, to ensure that we're reaching and finding yeah. new ways to address those things. Yeah, and I can tell you, Vicki, that I've had lots of conversations with lots of different people in lots of different drum corps, open class, world class, whatever, and they are all talking about these things, and I love that. And so I want to kind of bring it up here because they're all talking about reaching out to communities, um, private lessons. Chris, you know, I know that like the, the Madison Scouts are one of the cores that's been doing all of these online lessons with members. I've had lots of drum corps say that they spent the whole shutdown and they're spending the off season, you know, doing lessons one on one with members. And I'm thinking, OK, wow, not only do I get to have this member experience in the summer, but I'm actually getting musical instruction one on one in a lot of cases all throughout the winter. And I know the scouts are doing that really well, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the some of the, the the questions that you're bringing in is okay. Well, where where can we apply what we do and and be able to help solve and get exposure to this activity to others? Um, and we've been talking a lot about that in in the scouts as well. I mean, the the organization has a very long history of being community service oriented. And over the last several years, we've kind of looked at, looked at ourselves and said, wow, what, what sorts of things can we be doing better? Um, you know, several years ago, we brought in a drumline group called Black Star Drumline that's based in uh, Dane County, Madison uh, area. And, you know, we are working and we have about 30 students that are actively involved in that. But it's really about kind of just getting them the chance to sit behind a drum and learning the basics, right? And that's, you know, the fact of the matter is that the DCI, certainly at the DCI world-class level, I mean, that's essentially a meritocracy, okay? It means you gotta be really good to even make it up to that level, okay? And, you know, you hear that a lot, right? It's like, why, you know, why is there not more diversity and stuff like that? And a lot of it's that, you know, the the, the kids aren't given those opportunities way further down the, the chain than us. Um, you know, where does that, where do, where do they get that opportunity to learn to play a drum or to play an instrument or even see a show and get excited about a show? Um, so yeah, certainly on our side of it, we've been looking at that. Uh, we've certainly doing a lot of great teaching in our Black Star drum line. And, and will one of those kids ever make the Madison Scouts? Maybe. Uh, but it's probably, you know, very small probability of that they'd have to go through a whole lot to eventually get there. But we've certainly seen a, a few that are starting to show that. Um, you know, we had a sound, score, sound sport group and we had a couple kids come out of sound sport and eventually make the drum corps. Uh, and that was pretty exciting to watch and, and develop. You know, one of the things that we're working on this year is we're running three events in, in Wisconsin. And the marching arts in Wisconsin isn't, uh, you know, it's still really, really small, uh, the number of marching bands and stuff. But we're really trying to get a lot of them there. And at our Whitewater show, we're basically offering free tickets. We got a lot of capacity at Whitewater. And our whole thing is, you know, we want to remove every barrier for someone to be able to at least just get there and see this 
and go, wow, that's something that I want to do and kind of give them that pathway to figure out how to get there. Um, and so, you know, that, you know, that's that's a lot of the earlier barriers that you got to start getting across before eventually those kids make their way up to, to auditioning for a drum corps. Yeah, and Vicki, to your point, um, I've had lots of conversations with open class course. Everybody go to Marching Arts Education, just put the word open or open class in and see what comes up because um, lots of open class cores are taking musicians who exist on other instruments and helping them learn a brass instrument to be able to march. And that's, it's like a whole cottage industry that's really exciting to me, you know, because woodwind players used to sit around and complain all the time, oh, I can't be in drum corps. Okay, that's no longer true, everybody. Like they will teach you and help you learn to play a brass instrument. I think it's really exciting that there's lots of opportunities, especially at the open class level for that kind of experience. Yeah, and we yeah, have- I, Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say I'm a clarinet player. So. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I was a, I was sax player. But the um, one of the things we didn't foresee that has kind of kept come around to bite us on the butt is that um, in talking to some band directors this year, especially as they're getting their programs back up and running, we said, "Hey, love to have some of your kids come check it out this year. You know, we've eliminated a lot of the costs involved with the audition process, and they could come have a weekend. Our our alumni." basically prepaid for all the winter camps. So there was no camp fees and sort of stuff like that. And they're like, oh, my kids, are, my, my kids aren't ready for DCI. You know, that's the elite. I'm like, no, 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 you know, no. Like they, they should come check it out because we know from experience that all that it takes is one or two visits and they're hooked and they want to, you know, they want to put in the extra effort to do whatever it takes. So we are, you know, we're all, we're, we're all coming out of this malaise differently. Um, right now, in the last 24 hours, Philadelphia has announced that it's going back to masks starting on Monday, and there's talk about New Jersey going back to mandatory masking for for a bit, which is you know which is challenging because of of a, you know a lot of the variables that come with that with schools and how schools feel about outside groups coming in and using their facilities and whatnot. But to to the point to the overall point, you know, Chris is right on the money. Where like people say to me all the time. Well, how come there aren't more students of color in your core? I'm like, well, ask their fourth grade teacher. Like, you know, when, when they got started in the world of music, you know, were they exposed to anything that would have led them up to this point? Because you're right, at age 18, it's late to be getting into the game. But if they started this thing when they were when they were just, you know, an elementary school student learning band, and that's really where they where if we can do anything in our world to increase accessibility at that at that level, getting kids, maybe maybe it's an assembly program in the spring or something where we can get them thinking about stuff. At DCI's level, the instep band and now the Fantastic program, which is sort of an, an outgrowth of that, it actually involves middle school students to come and get immersed in our culture long before they're even in high school, before they've even necessarily been recruited by their own school systems band. And, it, that hasn't been fully scaled yet to, to be national, but certainly if ever there was a year where maybe maybe we have a little bit more flexibility in getting people to shows, uh, like, like Chris is saying about you know bringing them to Whitewater. I know Stuart Pompelis had some success in doing that at the at the at the Rose Bowl of getting groups to you know bring them not, don't just give them tickets, but actually help help them get to the event. You know, and, and this year we're trying to do that. One of the weird things that has occurred is that as the Jersey surf has grown and we've traveled more and more and more and more, we've become invisible on in our home base because we're never home when the core is in full bloom, other than perhaps Allentown. And there haven't been a lot, a whole lot of shows in our area. Um, so this year we're actually hosting a, a show at a university that's just bringing their own college marching band back into existence after a 15 year hiatus. And it sort of is the music education school in in our neck of the woods, and we're trying to do just that. It re, you know, re-stimulate what was at one point a very very fertile area with with getting those kinds of people involved. So having these sorts of conversations and saying to them, yeah, you know, cost is going to be a factor in no matter what you do, what kind of car you drive, where you choose to go to school, all of those things come with you know varying costs, but Let's have the conversation. Let's let's not start out by just assuming, well, I can't afford this. 
Um, and, and Vicky, Vicky hit the nail on the head. Really, we're looking for people who who really want to be good at something and really who really love it. And you know, because we're not a top top top, top tier world class core, like we do have a little bit more flexibility to to have a a a project. There's somebody who's like, hey, look, I I've been playing the sax. I I learned how to play baritone for this fall band season. You know, I'm not I'm not ready to play solos yet, but I really work hard and blah 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 blah. Like that person is likely to get to get a good shot at doing this. Um, you know, we just want to try to continue to create a welcoming environment so that they feel comfortable in doing so. Let Let's not have it lost on us the right now too. It's just to reiterate what these guys have said is a high school senior this year is the last high school student that saw a competitive DCI event. And what's so funny is we know our best recruiting avenue is having students see events, which is where in getting that, generating that excitement, whether whether it's Madison Scouts or Jersey Surf or, or any other core, and, and Blue Knights have some great ideas on this also, but just getting students back through the door of our events. There was a lot of, even last summer, mixed emotions with with the pandemic environment, right? And we don't know where that will go again. But we know, all sit here and know right now, when we get to show people like what we do, that's what makes students excited. And that's our most efficient way of finding those students that, that have that spark. And, and that's, that's where I get excited about bringing it, everything back to life um, in, in what we do. Um, and then I, I, I was picturing back even for, um, I grew up low income, you know, I, I had to fundraise all of my fees. I did not have a job and that was the nineties. It was even tougher then. And Jeff, my husband, uh, would make fun of like, it only cost $600 to March Colts in the nineties. But then I asked Jeff how much it cost to March Colts, like in the late seventies, it was like $60 until they added food. But Jeff had four siblings that marched and they weren't in a high income family either. And that's where I go back to, in all the ways we've increased professionalism, in the services we've added, I I don't feel willing to give up any of those things. And anytime anything increase in costs, that, that's more pressure on the directors, um, whether it's our board of directors or us as core, individual core directors, but everyone's committed to keeping costs as, as low as we can, you know? And I kind of roll my eyes when I say that, because yes, it's still, comes with the price, but I still go back to, um, there's a lot of kids that'll be really excited about this activity if they can see it again, and, and it can generate a life-changing experience. I would have never become a, a, a music educator had I not marched drum corps, you know, and and it, it's about getting great at anything. So that's, that's where I go back to. How do I identify, how do we help? And I was gonna say with a student, Let's say there's a student that really wants to do it. You know, for us right now, and especially with a lot of cores, it's submit an audition. The audition is free. Like the first step is submit the audition and like get some feedback. It doesn't mean you have to march even if you get a spot. But secondly, that's when if financials are the uh, only barrier, it's like, you know, first of all, you know, what do you have any skin in the game on your own, so to speak? You know, it's like, what can you do? Tell me your story. Like, if someone, and, and that does take a comfort factor, right? But even if someone can articulate their story, their interest, their excitement, you know, there are resources and opportunities to gain that that buy-in. And I think there's a lot of compelling stories out there that people want to support doing drum corps. We as directors can help guide those things. We're invested in helping, but it, it starts with some initiative from the student. And then going back to the shows, that's where that cycle goes to me. Like, I think the answer is having an event getting people through the door to that event, the spark starts. Yeah, everybody go to March Arts Education at the comment, click on DCI in the main menu, and you will find hundreds of hours, literally hundreds of hours of conversations. Some of them are about, what is it like in an audition? Um, you know, what are they looking for at an audition? All these things that we're talking about right now, go check that out and you will be surprised. Um, it's probably not what you expect and you'll be encouraged. The other thing, Vicky, to your point, I know that like every every high school band director that's listening to this conversation right now will admit that the best way to get your kids excited about your band and your marching band is to take them to see the very best thing you can, which is to see a drum corps. And they will come out of that ready to go practice 
and, and practice that clarinet and go out in the backyard and do the eight to five and toss their flag. And like, you know, you're right. It's for, it's in the world of marching in general, drum corps provides a service. It creates a way of motivation, a way of seeing what's possible. It gets everybody excited about being in the marching arts in general. And I'm glad also that that is back. So listen, directors, get your kids to shows. I can tell you it will transform what they see as possible and it will excite them to be a part of your program. Um, you know, something you guys mentioned in passing, I just wanted to say as we're ending this conversation is, um, I think, uh, Chris, you mentioned the volunteers, but like, I don't think people also know that there's like volunteers in every corps that spend hours and hours and hours of their summer making this possible. And again, that's another example of a way that Drum Corps um, is trying to find ways to cut costs and take care of students. And, you know, my I just try to feature those volunteers whenever possible. Put the word volunteer on our website as well, everybody, and you'll find so many wonderful conversations of, you know, that person in the cook crew who's been with the Phantom Regiment for, you know, 40 years every summer cooking meals and loves it, loves it, loves it. Um, it's part of who they are. Um, so anyway, we need to we need to wrap this up. I'm going to go around, let each of you say anything you want to say in closing. Chris, I'll just randomly go to you. What do you want to say to everybody to sort of wrap this up as we're finishing the conversation? Yeah, I think I would say that uh, uh, from, you know, a student looking at this activity, you know, absolutely find the ways that you can participate. Uh, like we had all said, you know, when, when students come to us and they say, you know, I think I'm going to struggle with coming up with tuition, uh, you know, we do, we bend over backwards to find ways to help them get there. We have a scholarship program. We have ways that we can really work with them uh, to, to get them on the field. So if that passion is there, pursue it. Um, and, and to the fans out there, I would say, you know, take a Number one, make sure you get to several shows this year. And number two, you know, really take a look at what these cores are doing. Um, you know, we all focus in on the scores and how everything finishes up on Saturday night as some sort of way of measuring all of this. But the real measurement of what's going on in this activity is behind the scenes. And I think we all need to kind of, you know, look at look to that and look to support that, whether it's volunteering or donating or, or somehow giving back to the activity in that way. Make sure that uh, you're looking at that uh, that factor to it. Yeah, that's great. Any small thing that we each can do really does add up to make a big difference. If every one of us that marched drum corps and loved it did like some one small thing, it would be a huge help to the activity. Vicki, what do you want to say as we're closing? Chris put that so well. So I everything Chris just said and, and really couple on to, I think that your points through the day, Tim, is that, I mean, between donations and uh, souvenirs, show attendance, but really that volunteerism factor, any of those contributions by any individual to any core does lessen the member cost, essentially. Yeah, great point. How about you, Bob? I would say that as, as we begin the next 50 years of DCI's evolution, I think that the passion that has gotten us this far will be the, the major uh, foundational element of where we go next. The directors, there's a lot of new blood now amongst the directors in, in the in the room um, as batons are being passed in a lot of organizations. There's never been more of a focus on the member experience. There's never been more of a focus on, on thinking about Drum Corps International and its participating groups in a different way is what is it that we're offering the world? Our members have changed. What they're looking for from the experience is a lot different. And I, and I think that there's a, a lot of passionate uh, and thoughtful conversation taking place about how organizations that exist within this collective can continue their own evolution to address the changing needs of the people that we serve. That's great. And I love that sort of this conversation is pointed out. Listen, everybody, they're working on this. Like they're all working on making it work, making it possible, making the member experience great, making it as fair a price as possible. And I think they're doing it. So guys, thank you so much for talking with me, Chris and Vicki and Bob, you guys were just terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Marching Arts Education is the home of the Marching Roundtable podcast. We give you access to the top marching arts professionals through live webinars, podcasts, videos, interviews, and online coursework. With over 1,000 podcasts and hundreds of webinars and videos, there are hours of great professional development for you and your staff. 
Sign up for a membership to Marching Arts Education to get complete access to all webinars, videos, and podcasts, plus discounts on coursework. Many directors are using professional development funds through their school or boosters to make these resources available to their staff. Imagine what you could do with so many great new ideas from the top professionals in our activity. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and sign up for our newsletter to find out about the latest podcasts, webinars, and new content. Find all of this and sign up at marchingartseducation.com.